Hello, and welcome to my walkthrough of the History Channel's Civil War, A Nation Divided. I'm going through the levels of this game chronologically, in the order they actually took place during the Civil War, not necessarily the order you play them in this game. Up next, we have the Battle of Gettysburg. July 1863. Confederate President Jeff Davis urges Lee to take the battle to the north. Lee sends Jeb Stuart around Union lines to invade the north in Pennsylvania. Stuart stumbles upon Gettysburg for no other reason than it warehouses boots, badly needed by his soldiers. Union generals Buford and Meade both converge on the rural Pennsylvania town. In no time at all, a ferocious battle begins. On the second day of fighting, in spite of the advice of his generals, Lee starts to attack the enemy's flanks at Little Round Top. The Federals must hold this position, or their entire line will be exposed to the Southern attack. Soldier, a sizable line of Rebs is coming down on us fast. Use your sniper rifle to pick them off. It's the only chance we got! Now, the Battle of Gettysburg is most likely the most famous battle of the entire war. It's the one the general public remembers as the major turning point. The General Lee had come up with a really bold campaign for the summer of 1863. His plan was to invade the North through Maryland and Pennsylvania, smashing right through the Union Army, and finally threaten the capital of Washington, D.C. And at this stage, the Confederate Army had won so many really significant battles over the last two years. General Lee was so trusted and respected at this point that his men were fighting just as much for him as they were for their entire cause. Confederate President Jeff Davis actually gave them a terms of surrender for the Union Army, and Lee had this document in his pocket throughout the entire battle. That's how confident the Confederates were that this invasion was going to end the whole war. There were, however, as you might expect, a lot of obstacles they'd have to overcome to make this happen. After two years of all-out war, the rebels were desperately short of soldiers, they were low on ammunition, and above all supplies, even basic supplies like shoes. A lot of Lee's army were marching barefoot here. One of the major advantages of invading the North is that the rebels could live off the land. Maryland and Pennsylvania were rich with resources, like there was plenty of food. But for the first time in the war, General Lee's judgment and decision-making would come under a lot of scrutiny. For the two years prior, it was the Northern commanders who were making all the questionable decisions that would ultimately cost them really important battles. Now, I strongly feel that if Stonewall Jackson had not died after the battle at Chancellorsville, that most of the bad decisions that Lee made at Gettysburg wouldn't have happened in the first place. For example, the commander of Lee's cavalry, Brigadier General Jeb Stewart, had come up with this idea to take his entire corps on a broad sweep through Union territory to disrupt their communications, meaning Lee wasn't going to have any contact with Stewart until he returned. It's pretty clear that this plan was Stewart's idea. What's not clear is why Lee agreed to it. In the days before radio communications, your cavalry are supposed to be the eyes and ears of your entire army. They're not infantry. These men are on horseback, and it's their job to find out where the enemy is, how great their numbers are, and report this back to their commander. And normally, Jeb Stewart was fantastic at this. Lee had always relied on him for his intelligence, and Stewart had never let him down before. But this was a horrible decision. It would mean that for several days in June, leading right up to the Battle at Gettysburg, that Lee was not going to be receiving any army intelligence at all, leaving him virtually deaf and blind. This was not the case for the Union Army, it was pretty much the exact opposite. Since the Confederates were marching through Union territory, local townspeople would tell the Federals what direction the Rebels were heading and how big their army was. So, going into Gettysburg, the North had the advantage in intelligence, 
and artillery, and in sheer manpower, their army is still twice the size of the Confederacy. Now, when the opening cutscene to this chapter said that the Battle of Gettysburg happened virtually by accident, that is 100% true. One of Lee's commanders, General Keith, had moved his men towards Gettysburg to forage for supplies. He'd heard there was a warehouse there that had a lot of boots, and his men really needed boots, not knowing that he was going to run into two brigades of Union cavalry headed by General John Buford. Now, Buford's numbers were about 2,700 men, whereas Heath had about 7,500 men. So Buford, seeing how vastly outnumbered he was, did really the only thing he could have done, and that's stall for time and send word back for Union reinforcements. And he did that really well. He did anything and everything he could think of that would eat up 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, and give the Union infantry time to arrive. One of the first things he did was take all of his men off a of horseback so the Confederates would think they were up against Union infantry, not cavalry. So they're bringing up their artillery, their cannons, and spreading out into battle lines. The problem with having to delay and buy as much time as possible is that you have to sacrifice your own We've soldiers. We've got to get out of here. Retreat to Little Round Top on the double. Eliminate every soldier on the way. Gee, move it now or die where you stand. Yeah, he took a lot of casualties, but one thing I think that helped them pull it off for as long as they did is that they were using Sharp's carbine rifles, whereas the Confederates were still using their rifled muskets. The muskets take about 30 seconds to reload. They only fire one shot, and then it takes 30 seconds to reload them, whereas by that time, the Sharps rifles already fired twice. So in the hands of a really skilled soldier, in just over, say, two minutes or so, the Sharps rifle has fired maybe 10 times at best, and the muskets have only fired four. And a cool thing about this game is that you get to use both of these weapons in this chapter. It's pretty cool. And as the day wore on, and more and more Confederate soldiers were showing up, their numbers were just too great. And they ended up pushing Buford's cavalry right back into the town of Gettysburg itself. But that actually worked out in their favor, because the Confederates weren't out in open wilderness anymore, and having to fight street by street, house by house, in these really cramped, confined spaces really slowed the rebel force down tremendously and was, in effect, what stopped all of the fighting on that first day. And as the sun was going down, Buford had managed to find some high ground at the south end of Gettysburg, and this is what would set in motion all of the events over the next two days. Now, at this point, Robert E. Lee is still feeling extremely confident, and why shouldn't he be? They pushed the Union back and captured the town of Gettysburg. But what he'd actually done was give the Union army control over the best terrain to fight on for the rest of the battle. So at around 9 a.m. the next morning, General George Meade arrives, bringing with him almost the entire Union Army. Abraham Lincoln had relieved Joseph Hooker of his position as commander of the Army of the Potomac just three days before Gettysburg and replaced him with Meade, George Meade being the fourth general to hold this position in the last two years. So what he did was set up the Union line all the way around the high ground that Buford had found the night before. This line was famously shaped like a fish hook and was about three and a half miles long. The hook circled all the way around Colt's Hill at the top, then came down through Cemetery Ridge and Cemetery Hill and continued down to Little Round Top. And right below Little Round Top was Big Round Top, but this early on day two, this hill wasn't being defended by the Union yet. Now, all of this is high ground. The Union soldiers set up their positions and piled up rocks and anything they could get their hands on and had completely fortified these hills. So going into day two, the Federals were bringing far more men, were in a much more concentrated position, and obviously it was easier for them to relay information to one another. Day two was literally an uphill battle for the rebel in every way. They tried for eight hours straight to take Culp's Hill at the top, 
and Robert E. Lee would have loved to have flanked all the way around the hill and attacked the Union from behind, but he couldn't do that. Because there's nothing behind Culp's Hill but water, so he was forced to attack the hill directly, and eight hours later, the Union line at Culp's Hill was still intact. And at the same time, three miles away, at Little Round Top, there was a Union general named Dan Sickles, and I swear, there is nothing I would love more than to give you some information on this man's life. He was a really interesting guy. But I'm not going to do that because most of what makes his life so fascinating has nothing to do with the Battle of Gettysburg. He looked out over Little Round Top and saw that there was some even higher ground a little ways up ahead. So he decided, on his own, to move his entire corps to this higher ground. Now, that doesn't sound like a bad idea, but what he did wrong was he didn't tell George Meade he was doing this. Sickles was supposed to be defending Little Round Top, where Robert E. Lee was already planning a full frontal assault. And since Lee, or excuse me, since Sickles had changed his men's position, Lee couldn't do that now. He had to completely change his plan. What he decided to do was attack Sickles' men head on while at the same time, he sent four of his brigades around Sickles' line in a flanking move to attack the Union over Big Round Top, which at this point still wasn't being defended. A George Meade countered this by sending in a corps that he was holding in reserve for just such an emergency, so Lee's plan didn't succeed here either. The rebels did manage, however, to push Sickles' men off their new high ground and force them to fall back, but all they'd really accomplished was pushing them back to the original position they were supposed to be defending in the first place. And that's actually what we're doing in this game right here. We're falling back to Little Round Top. So at the end of day two, just like at the north end of the battlefield at Culp's Hill, at the south end, the Union line remained intact. Over here is where you find the secret document for this level. Elizabeth, I just got over a nasty spell of fever, so it's hard for me to move sometimes. I finally got one letter out of three you wrote. Honey, tell your mother not to worry you too much. I'm coming back to you. I know these months are hard, but you're in my heart every day. Please don't take another fellow. Now, I know I just breezed through all of that. There's so much more that can be said about day two of this battle. It was by far the bloodiest of all three days. General Lee had already lost over 20,000 men at this point gigantic loss for two days fighting, but knowing the Confederates really needed this victory for their cause, he needed a completely new plan for day three. He tried to punch through the enemy's left flank, and it failed. He tried to go through the right flank, and that didn't work either. So his plan for the third day was the most obvious one, and it's what the Battle of Gettysburg is mostly remembered for today, and that is Pickett's Charge. Lee wanted to strike the center of the Union line with an infantry charge of 12,000 men to create an opening, and then pass through it, spread out on both sides, opening up the Union line. This would happen after an artillery barrage using 160 cannons. Now, the first major problem with this is that there was some miscommunication about the fuses used to light these cannons. Lee's men fired these cannons for an hour and a half at the Union Army, not realizing that they were firing right over their heads. There was so much smoke that the rebels couldn't see what they were shooting at. There was so much smoke, the Union couldn't see the enemy firing at them. All they knew was that this artillery barrage wasn't landing anywhere near them. We got him! Take over the big Gatling gun, son. Mow down anything that isn't already dead. So, George Meade orders a ceasefire to let the smoke clear. And when the smoke finally does clear, Robert E. Lee mistook the silence to mean that they'd actually smash the Union cannons, freeing up George Pickett's men to charge towards the center of the Union line at Cemetery Hill. And there lies the next major problem. Pickett's men, 
we're going to have to march for almost a full mile over flat ground with no cover, while the Union Army are firing cannons at them. And this is why I think Pickett's Charge is so well remembered today. These men, who were facing impossible odds, and despite all the carnage that was going on around them, refused to give up. They wouldn't stop. They were packed together and being pinned down by enemy fire, but a small portion of them actually managed to make it to the wall and briefly, very briefly, capture some of the enemy guns. Even though they were summarily beaten back and defeated at bayonet point, this still goes down as one of the greatest acts of heroism in military history. Now, anyone who considers themselves to be a historian will give you different theories and different opinions about anything that's happened in the past, but in this case, most historians will agree that Pickett's charge was poorly planned, it was poorly executed, and it never should have happened in the first place. As Lee's men were falling back, he was running up to them, almost in hysterics, shouting, It's all my fault! I'm so sorry, this is all my fault! Now, people can say whatever they want to say, and they do, about Robert E. Lee. But I'd like to throw this in at the end. I think his willingness to accept the consequences for his actions and take responsibility for the decisions that he made, unlike a lot of other generals after the war, not not only says a lot about his character, but you have to remember that even after the total disaster that was the Battle of Gettysburg, this man still conducted a campaign against the North that lasted for another two years. However, regardless of that, on the third day at Gettysburg, he did send three divisions of rebel infantry up against seven corps of Union soldiers on unfavorable ground. So, you really can't argue that point either. Fix bayonets, man! We're going to charge! Once again, there's so much more that can be said about this battle. I sincerely hope that I've done it some kind of justice in the short time that I've had here, suffice to say that, historically, the Battle of Gettysburg represents the last chance the Confederacy would have at winning the Civil War. It was a major strategic defeat for the South, and it was one that they'd never recover from. But I'm trying to save my ammunition here. But there we go. Thank you guys so much for watching. The third day of battle is no less fateful. Sensing victory, Lee orders General George Pickett to charge an open field, where behind a stone wall, the Union Army holds Cemetery Ridge. At 2 p.m., Pickett begins his charge with 13,000 men. Red flags wave and bayonets shine in the July sun. It's an unimaginable slaughter. Single cannon blasts from the Union side kill a dozen packed together bodies at once. The Confederates reach the stone wall at one place only. They are all captured or killed. Taking full responsibility for the disastrous charge, Lee will never again attempt to invade the North. 6,500 Confederates die or are taken prisoner. All in all, 51,000 men on both sides are killed during three days of warfare. Despite Lincoln's urgent pleas, Meade refuses to attack the retreating army. His own troops are too exhausted. No one knows it yet, but it's the beginning of the end for the Confederacy.